Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rude Awakening TV. Uh, I see I have some friends that have joined in. Uh, today we're going to make Japanese milk buns, not entirely. You'll see where we're going with that. We're going to make uh, chicken paprikash, a nice Hungarian warm winter meal, and uh, some German stutzel. If you want to make it Hungarian, you're going to, going to call it nokedli. So today we're going to start off with checking out my apron again because I think I failed to bring to your attention the fact that it crisscrosses in the back. I want you to look at that. If you are a cook that has difficulties with your neck and you really just want to have some freedom of that, if you look at the crisscross in the back, this is a real comfort zone. So just wanted to bring your attention to that. So uh, we're going to turn on our burner. And uh, I'll talk to you about the, the Japanese milk buns. So in order to make anything that has yeast, you need to do it. If you're going to do it live, you need to do it in two stages. And I felt like that was a super waste of food because I would have to make two different batches of those. So what I've done, because it needs an hour to prove, what I've done is I've made them ahead of time. I'll walk you through that when we get to that. And uh, then you can see the real difficult part of that is actually rolling it out and uh, shaping it into the pan. So we'll get to that. So uh, Nicole is going to uh, make this with me today. Uh, we have got our pot and uh, we're going to get it nice and hot because we're going to put some butter in it. Maybe you remember the test on how to make sure your pot is hot. You take a little bit of water. It won't be hot yet. And you're just going to go like that. Nothing. So it's cold. We'll get that there. Let's see who's here. Nicole is here and she says she is ready to cook along with me. Well, she's going to actually make it for dinner, she says. So that's great. Uh, something else while we're waiting for my pan to heat, I'd like to bring your attention to this little guy. This is free vegetables you can grow in your kitchen. You take a beet that has a little bit of sprouting on it. It's an old beet. And you put it into, just stick it into some uh, topsoil, some potting soil, and water it. And then within two weeks, you're going to have this. You snip these pieces off, and you add it to a salad, or you eat these plain. It's We call it lockdown lettuce, because every time there's a lockdown, I grow this, and we have it in our salad. OK, our pan's starting to get hot. So what we need to do is add a quarter cup of butter. So let's put a quarter cup of butter into the pan. I want to go to this. It's a big pan, and it looks like we're overplaying it, but there's a lot of chicken that's going to go in it. So this chicken paprikash is a, a dinner that my family would have eaten when I was a kid. My mom used to make it. Uh, my aunts used to make it. My grandmother used to make it. It's a nice Sunday dinner. I do hope that some of my uh, drag kitties are here. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some laughs with them. I've been watching a lot of, uh, while the butter is cooking, we're going to cut our onion. Now, I would think that uh, some Hungarian chefs, home cooks, would not have put celery and carrots, the holy trinity. We are going to today because as we were talking about last Sunday, we said that it adds so much flavor. It all cooks down. It's going to add a little color. Joan is on stream. Uh, yes, Joan has made it. Yes, she has. She told me that she hasn't made it in years. And I'm really thinking that she has not made it like this because the way that my mom would make it, my aunts would make it, was a little different. And uh, some people would use chicken thighs. I'm using uh, boneless chicken breasts. I find that it's a, just a really nice meat. There's no bone in it. There's no skin. Everything's good. This is about four boneless chicken breasts maybe about four pounds because they were really large. So what I want you to do is you cut that up into bite-sized pieces like so. And then you're going to add a little, just dust them. Monique and Bowden are here. Hi, Bowden. How are you today? 
Okay, so I've dusted my the uh, the diced up chicken breast with a little bit of flour. It's just going to cause a little bit of thickening. All right, we're looking at that. We're getting a little bit of browning. So let's get our chicken in. Hi, honey. Okay, we're going to put that into the butter. You notice I didn't put the vegetables in. We don't want those to overcook. So we're going to put this on. We're going to brown that. Mmm, I can smell that butter. It's a really nice size pan for this much too. So, you know, chicken th boneless chicken thighs would be nice if that's kind of your thing. But try to get skinless because the skin is what adds a, a, way too much fat. Here's where it's an unusual dish now. You're going to put in some uh, Hungarian paprika, two types of paprika. If you're going into uh, a market that sells Hungarian paprika, you want sweet paprika, not just regular. It'll be too hot. So Hungarian sweet paprika, three. You're putting that on the chicken. Okay, three tablespoons. I think my sister really likes this meal. I wish I could send some of it to her. Okay, now you want to put in kosher salt, not table salt, not sea salt. You want to put in kosher salt, and you want not a lot. Kosher salt tends to uh, have a lot more power. Half a teaspoon of uh, white kosher salt. Oh, I guess there's no other color. Put that in there. Don't be tempted to put a little more because it looks like so little. Just keep it at half a, te half a teaspoon. The paprika is going to give you a lot of flavor. And ample ground pepper, whatever amount suits your family. My dad loves pepper, so we always put a lot of pepper in our foods. Mm, you're going to see, look at the bottom of that pan. You'll see the paprika starting to form a really nice coating. And the, flou and the flour on the chicken is making it thicken up and hold on to all of that. All right. I've got it on rather high heat because I want to sear these pieces of meat. That's a lot of pepper, but that's good. Okay, so we're going to um, get this browned. Give it some time. I hope everybody's having a great Sunday. It's really cold in the Kawartha Lakes. It's about 23 below, and uh, that's cold, but uh, it's really sunny, so that keeps us warm. Let's turn it down because, whoa, we're seeing some uh, too much browning. Okay, so you're going to wonder, what, what is she going to do with all that chicken? I'm going to remove that chicken. So if you're cooking with me, you want to get some kind of a platter to uh, remove the chicken. We don't want to overcook it. It'll have time to cook again. Uh, sure, let's put our recipe up, and this will show you the uh, ingredients. Wow, I've got some real heat going here. Just, you'll see. You've got all these little bits of, of uh, paprika fond at the bottom and chicken. That's okay. Now, when I take this chicken out, I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil. The recipe doesn't call for it, but I can see that there's a, this chicken, it may be because of the flour, it took a lot of that butter. Now, my sister always feeds chicken to her dog, but I don't think Mindy is going to like all this paprika. All right, we're removing it. As you can see, it's not fully cooked. And this is a, a basic saute that you're doing with this meat. However, it's only 75% cooked. All right, you can see my pan is a little bit uh, brown there. That's okay. Get all the chicken out that you can. And we're just going to set that aside. You could tent it if you think you're going to be a while. Let's put a little bit of oil, a little bit. That looked like about two tablespoons of oil. And we're going to add in our celery. Now, the recipe doesn't say, the recipe that's up right now does not say celery and carrots. I made this earlier in the week, and I thought, why not add celery and carrots? That sounds like a really nice addition and extra flavor and extra color. Okay. There we have it. We have celery. Mmm, look at that, picking right up. Celery, carrots, onions. One medium onion. Remember, it's 
uh, two parts onion, one part carrot, one part celery, and that's your mirepoix. And you can see, look at look at the uh, vegetables taking on those bits from the bottom. I did turn it down. I'm starting to smell the onions. Curiously, it smells like a little bit of garlic, but there's no garlic in there. Okay. Earlier, we were talking about the milk buns. And uh, when I was starting to prep it, I realized that uh, I, I, I was just trying to do too much in one in one cooking show. So uh, the, the milk buns, the recipe is uh, on Instagram. And if you'd like to try it, there's two different methods. And this week I made both methods. One method is where you make uh, a roux. And it's the Tengzong method. It's a Chinese method that's used in a Japanese milk bun. The other one is straight up a Japanese style where the method where you add everything in. If you would like to look that recipe up, uh, I just want to give you one little bit of advice. Make sure that your yeast and your salt stays apart. If your yeast and your salt, you may have made bread before and said this doesn't work, I don't know why. It's because the yeast and the salt joined and if they mix, it's game over right there. We're going to return, because that's nice and translucent now, we're going to return the chicken to the pot and let it fully cook. Easy peasy so far, correct? All right, now I've got the onions cooked separately. Look at the way the carrots coat that. That's nice. Don't leave them too big. That way this is going to cook nice. And here's where we're going to add in our broth. So we're adding in one and a half cups of chicken stock. You can make it, you can buy it. So we'll just pour that right in like that. And you'll, this, this dish is one of those dishes that you can just decide to make. And as long as you've got the thawed chicken breasts, it's just a one pot meal and it's delicious. I'm, uh, we don't need to add anything more. We just need to let this cook. Just checking to make sure I've made it all okay. Yep, all this has to do now is cook. So I'm gonna turn it back up a little bit more. Stir it up. Look at that. This sits and cooks. I'm going to leave it on a fair amount. And then the next thing that we're going to add is this one cup of sour cream. Now, uh, you can use any kind of sour cream. I wouldn't advise you to use uh, a, a no-fat yogurt, which some people do to replace. I don't think that it would work in this dish because this is really predominant in this dish. So last time I made this, I lowered this to half a cup and it was fine. Uh, I'm going to add the one cup today, but I have to let this cook. Last week, uh, we tried to do an unboxing video and it didn't work, but this week I think we've got it. So we're going to go to that while I prepare for us to make the spatzel. Yeah. Hey, what's up you guys? If you watched my live stream last Sunday, you saw us do an unboxing and it was a lot of fun. But we got a box today. I didn't want to wait till, uh, to unbox it on Sunday. So we're going to unbox today and show it to you on Sunday. There we are. We don't know what it is. We randomly order things that we don't know what it is. It might not be as fun as my teacups, but I think it might be. Oh, this looks fun. Okay, we have, oh, cool. You know what this is? This is a remote control for your smartphone so you don't have to reach in when you're doing a video and go like that. This is a camera. Can you see on this camera? This is a uh, iPhone camera. <laughs> Good. So uh, an iPhone, not an iPhone camera. Uh, this is an iPhone remote control for your camera. I guess you hook it on here. 
We're going to get that later on. We're going to figure that out so that it can be on your wrist and you can go and you can turn your phone on and off, take the picture, stop the video so that you don't have to lean in towards your video. Fun. What else did we get? The non-stop need for adapters. I'm going to put that over there. So it's actually called a Cam Kicks Bluetooth Remote Shutter. That's what that is. This is a USB to 3.5 digital audio adapter. That's so you can go from your USB port to your headphones. Very nice. If this is a little card that says Cable Matters. It's our extended warranty. And there it is. What a beaut. Just a little tiny thing. Just goes from your USB to your 3.5 phone jack all right let's set that but the most fun the most fun are you ready we've been really looking forward to this this is a Mookie brand microphone put your iPhone on a stand and this way you can just take uh, random videos if you choose without having to set up all of your webcams this one is a little bit portable all right look at this look at this will you it comes in its own little case look at that how nice is that we're pretty excited about it let me unzip it for you Ooh, and ah oh, it's got a toupee Actually, it's not. It is a windsock, I would assume. Uh, oh, so, okay, so here's how this works. This is really slick. This is good quality, too. It's not plastic. So you've got your tripod stand. Cool. I'm not going to set it up completely because I might. Oh, maybe. I think you have this next thing, which is for your iPhone. It's okay so you would put your iPhone in here we'll see how this works in a bit and then uh, you have it's gonna take me a little bit of time look at that the case comes in for storage it comes in the foam that's really nice and then we have the Mookie mic and I think we have to figure this out uh, the nice thing about this I don't know We'll figure oh I see I think it snaps in like this and then the Mookie mic sits like that the nice thing about this microphone and that one of the reasons why we chose it is because uh, the adapters allow you to charge this so some of these uh, microphones if you've noticed if you've looked online about these some of these microphones go right through your phone and use your phone charge whereas this one you can recharge and apparently it has 40 hours so uh, that microphone will sit on top and there is uh, a complete little kit minus the light there's no light so you'll have to provide an outsource of, of light but this is a cute little kit that you can just do any kind of video you want very quickly all right thought you might enjoy that can't wait to use the windsock bye <laughs> Hi, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. It gave me a little time to clean up and get ready for our next thing. So I've switched up our pots and uh, this camera. And uh, I've put the uh, paprika over here to cook. You, can, uh, you can't see it from there. Oh, it's simmering really nice. Uh, I'm going to turn it down just a bit using the big girl stove over here. So I have got our water boiling. Now, to make spatzel, to make nokedli, you're going to say, but I don't have this cool little machine. This cool little machine, after I bought it, I realized you don't need to. You can make it. If you've got a steamer at your house or at your kitchen, or if someone you know has one, you can use this steamer to make this. You can also, you could use just a colander as well. It's just that this doesn't give you the bigger holes and doesn't give you the base. But if that's what you have, that's what you have. I'm going to show you that you could make it in this steamer. You would put the dough in the bottom. 
you would put it over the pot and then you would just uh, spread it through and it's going to drop through here. How does the Spetzel maker work? It's the same actual theory. You will put the dough into this. I'll put this over the pot and I just drag it back and forth. So you can see that this steamer would be equal value in that in that technique. So this is just one cup of all-purpose flour, nothing more than that, and uh, a quarter milk, a quarter cup of whole milk. I use Kawartha Dairy's whole milk. They're they're uh, ingredients are local and they're very fresh. Okay, so I've mixed that in there. I'm going to add two eggs. Uh, yeah, I did. All right, I'm going to uh, mix this up. But I didn't add everything. So what's in here? One cup of flour, a quarter cup of whole milk. Now you might see on the recipe that's posted that it called for water. And let's talk about the difference there. You're going to get a creamier, denser, uh, a little bit more nutritious. This uh, is not the best. A nutritious noodle. So I say stick to the milk, but maybe you don't really want to use the milk. Oh, you know what I should be using? I should be using my Danish whisk. Yes, indeed, I should be because the balloon style whisk, everything got stuck in there. Let's get that out. Don't want to waste any of it. All right, so I didn't add the salt yet. I want to add half a teaspoon. There, that's better. I want to add half a teaspoon of salt, not kosher salt for this. This we want to use just white table salt. Half a teaspoon. My teaspoon is gone. All right, half a teaspoon in here. Right. Uh, I added pepper. You don't have to because it's not really... If you have white pepper, it would be nicer. You wouldn't see the pepper grounds, but I'm going to put pepper in anyway. Now, if it's a German recipe, you're going to add a little bit of nutmeg. We tried it with the nut nutmeg. If it's a Hungarian-based recipe, you're going to leave out the nutmeg. Today, I'm going to leave out the nutmeg, but I did want to tell you that you'll see many recipes that have nutmeg in it. So, you'll see we talked about the Danish whisk last week. Look how nice that mixes it up. And this dough is going to be a little bit like a pancake batter. Don't expect it to be like bread dough or pasta dough. It's very loose. I have to make sure that my water is boiling, and it is. Now, who's going to be the smarty pants and tell me what I should do to my water? I should salt it and be generous with the salt. That's where your flavor is coming from. Uh, Danish whisk or Dutch whisk, they are interchangeable. However, uh, Danish whisk is what you'll find online if you're looking for one. If you'll notice too, they're all made in a unique style because they're handmade. So this one has one eye. Uh, I have another one that has two eyes. And that's just depending on what density of your dough is. So this one, it, you know, this, this dough is pretty heavy. A, a bread dough, I would use this one. The double eye one, I might use more if I'm mixing a cake or pancake batter. Okay, you see how loose that is? You didn't expect that. You probably thought more like a noodle dough. All right, we're going to go over to this camera and get ready. It goes really fast. This is not one of those slow processes. So how long did it take me to make the chicken? Maybe 30 minutes. You know, you come home from where you've been and you can do that. You take this, and I wish this pot was a little bit bigger. I want to make sure I'm not putting it on the side of the pot. I'm going to put this right in. This is where you could use your strainer or your steamer. Get it all in there. Be ready for the spetzel to happen. Okay, I slide it. You probably can't see, maybe you can. You're just back and forth. This recipe I made, uh, it makes just enough for about three people. If you want to make more, just double it, triple it, whatever. You might have to do it in a few batches. Getting a little bit of a mess. And you can see, if you can see this camera, it's this is empty. Just 
this is nice. And it's not like you absolutely need, but look at that. Look at those little tiny spetzel. No, Kedley. It's easy to make this, though, and it takes a little bit of time to cook. Not much. When they float to the surface of the water, it's done. But I go just a little bit. But look how nice and puffy those are. That's delicious. These eggs are very fresh, and that helps, too. Okay, these eggs were very fresh, so I'm getting nice puffy. Look at that. Those are going to be delicious. The salt made them nice and flavorful. I want to just make sure I have time to make sure that these are cooked right. This is a meal that you could have made easily coming home from a day. It's not one of those that you need to be home all day and cook. I like it. So we're going to now switch and put our, our chicken paprikash back on. All right. There's the dish. Look how nice and brown that's become. It is going to start simmering away. Now we have the fun part. Let's put in our sour cream. Uh, yeah, they do look a little bit like cheese curds. Okay, so let's put in the one cup of sour cream. If you'd like to cut it down, that's great. I'm, I, like I said, I made it with half a cup because that's all I had. And it worked. All right, I really like to strain those because um, I'm going to drain these noodles. I don't want them sitting in that water and getting waterlogged. Okay, we're going to let those drain. So yummy. Look at that sour cream mixing in there. You don't need to do much else than let it dissolve, let it melt away in there. Now the flour that we coated the chicken with is starting to thicken it. Look at that. You're saying it's not really that thick. Well, you let it cook down a bit. If you notice the bottom, you can't see it, but the bottom of my pan no longer has anything stuck to it. That's the beauty of deglazing a pan with any kind of broth or wine is it cleans your pot for you. Two ways I could do this. I can mix the spatzel right in, and that's yummy. Or you can serve it with the spatzel down on top of a platter, and then you can put the uh, chicken paprikash on top. But I always do it that way. Today I think I'm going to mix it in, and that'll help. Uh, that'll help to make it a one-pot meal, and it'll also help it to thicken up a bit. Okay. Mixed in, remove this, and let's just mix that in. Oh, that looks yummy. Plus now, this is how my mom would have made it, and probably my sister too, because now the noodles, uh, the spatzel no kedli, take on a little bit of color, which is nice. You can cook that down like that. Look at that. One meal, and that took us, well, we started, that took us half an hour to get that. Of course, I had some prep done, but that took us about a half an hour to get uh, the whole meal done. Now, what I'd like to do, I just diced up a little bit of uh, parsley. If you don't have parsley fresh like this, then just put in dried parsley. It still adds a nice color and ta-da! We have a beautiful meal ready to eat. I'm going to shut this off though because I don't want that to heat anymore. That is going to sit and it's ready for our dinner tonight. Okay, let's take that off. We put it back on here. We put it on the big girl stove. And that's done. We're going to tidy up a bit. And now I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to talk about those Japanese milk buns. Okay, the Japanese milk buns were made ahead of time, but let's go through why I made those ahead of time. Ooh, ah, nice. Okay, bringing your attention to, uh, I don't know if you can see the other side of the cupboard over there. The other side of the cupboard has a heating pad, and that's how I proof it. I don't have an, a real proofer, so I proof it on a heating pad. I made this dough this morning uh, about an hour before the show started, so it's, it took me an hour. Two methods. I want to show you what 
method I used. Okay, so it's on my Instagram. I put three tablespoons of water, three tablespoons of whole milk, and two tablespoons of flour. That's it, and I make a roux in a little pot like this. My sister gave me this pot, by the way. I love it. Uh, I make a roux in this little pot, and then I add all the other ingredients that are in the recipe into a bowl. Just keep the salt and the yeast, a heating pad, yes, that's the best proofing, and then I cover it with towels. So you make your roux, set it aside, let it come to room temperature, and then you put the rest of the ingredients in a bowl, and they're on that recipe on my Instagram and my Facebook. Just keep the yeast and the salt apart. Just mix that a little bit to incorporate all those. Add this, and then just beat it by hand, or put it on, your, on the hook on your KitchenAid, and you let it get into a really sticky dough. And then you add some butter to it, four tablespoons of butter. And that's what got me to this point. So I want to show you, though, how we roll this. This is how we roll. OK, we want to flour our, our board a bit, just a little bit. If you just uh, joined us, we made chicken paprikash today with uh, no kedli or or uh, German spetzel noodles. Took us 30 minutes to make the entire meal. And now that meal is done and you can go about whatever you want it to do. And now we're about to roll uh, the Japanese milk bun. So this dough, it's really, you stick your thumb in the middle and it shouldn't bounce back. It's ready to go. It's really a soft dough. You can see how soft that is. Okay, so I'm using, just toss it. If you use your hands, you're going to have an issue because this is a really soft dough. You can see it's lovely. Don't use too much flour. And just fold it over. Let get some, get some flour there and fold it. Uh, as, you, as I told you earlier last week, I'm a culinary arts student at Kaiser University. Uh, my professor um, encourages me to do these videos. He thinks they're awesome, although he did think I was crazy doing bread already, but hey. Okay, so I've got a nice dough. Just going to flatten it out like that, and I'm going to divide it in three. So let's see. I'm going to go down the middle first. I've got two loaves I could do there. Let's divide it in four, like so. And I think I'm going to make four rolls. I made three last time, and that worked really well. Not there. OK, how do we do this? Eh, you know what? Let's try and do this, because I think this is going to work. We're going to put this one in the middle. All right. The idea of these Japanese buns or bread is that they're flaky. They're tear apart. How do you get them that way? Well, cool little rolling pin. You can use anything. You don't need this. So I'm going to do it like this, and I'm going to roll. Roll it up, and then it's almost like I'm making a cinnamon bun, but I'm not. And then just making that roll. And I'm putting it into this pan that I did not grease. I'd like to put a little oil in it just so that they come out nice. All right, we're going to put this one in the middle, like so. <laughs> yeah, so this, this dough would work well for cinnamon buns. OK, let's make sure this one's not too big. It might be a little bit big. We'll add a little bit over here. You know, what, what would be ideal here is to get your scale out and to weigh it and make sure that you've got three even pieces. All right, so we don't, though. Really nice. You can see that just the way that this dough plays, it's nice. You see that? You can see that it's curled up like that. That is going to really come out nice when it, when it cooks. It's a little bit big. It's OK. Play with it a bit. So you, you'll say, well, isn't she kneading it? Well, I did that the first time around in my machine. And you can do it by hand. I prefer to do it with my machine because I can't really do this 
the right consistency. It just takes so much effort. If you don't have a machine with a hook, then it's, I have done these by hand. So again, flatten it, roll it. Make sure that the end is going to meet up because this is the part that's going in the pan. So it looks like I've crammed in here. This is really going to come out nice. Now, these three are going to round out and look like one big loaf. It's a tearaway loaf. I've got a little bit of a milk wash here. I'm going to uh, egg wash with some milk in it. My oven is preheated to 350. And yes, they are going to cook for 30 to 35 minutes. I'm even, oh, I splashed. I'm even going to set the timer today because bread I don't mess around with. It smells good early, but doesn't mean that it's done. So this egg wash is going to give them a real nice dark color. Okay, but I don't put this in right away. I cover this, put it back on my heating pad, and I let them rise. Uh, I would say maybe about 40 minutes to uh, 50 minutes. So I'm going to go put those on the heating pad. <laughs> There, I don't know if you can see that far, but it's underneath a towel. It's nice and ready to go in. And there are proofers. You can get a proofing machine, but that is the way my grandmother would have done it, and it works for me. Okay, so we've got our chicken paprikash done, ready to be eaten. We've got our rolls that I could actually, the, the cool thing about those is you can now cover those and put those in the fridge and even take them out 30 minutes before you're going to eat and you can have fresh hot rolls. I might even do that this afternoon. So those are there. They can rise. They won't rise over the pan. They will rise just enough that you can cook them and that will be maybe for dinner. Okay, so we're going to clean this up a bit. And I want to show you, last week we talked about uh, rice pudding. And somebody brought rice pudding up, and I thought, well, I can't make rice pudding also. But I can show you how to make it. The reason I don't make it is because uh, the food that I cook here on a Sunday is what my family actually eats for dinner. So I hate to waste food. And that would have been too much food in my house today. Uh, you'll see that I'm putting water on my board. I never soak the board because you don't want water on it. You see, I wipe it like that, but before I put it away today, I'll rub it with a mineral oil or an olive oil. Uh, I, I hope you're enjoying my YouTube channel. Uh, Liz, my daughter, is uh, my editor, and she does fantastic work when she does it. I actually look forward for the uh, videos to be edited because I think they're funny. Uh, another thing is... It has come to my attention that people say, how come it's so rude? Like, why do you call your company Rude Awakening? And that is a Liz story. Because when she was a teen, we had a kitchen that you could see all up into the bedrooms. And she used to come out every morning and say, this is such a rude awakening. And so I decided that because my, my company started with a breakfast cereal and it was a rude awakening, I was going to take that name. So that's how I got my name for my company. All right. This is called a double boiler. I don't know how to make rice pudding without a double boiler. This is uh, a weird story. When I was 14, my grandmother gave me a birthday present and it was a double boiler. That might sound like another average 14 year old say, what? I was excited about it. So that's how I was taught to make rice pudding. And so this is what you do. You put water in the bottom of this. I'm sure some of you have seen a, a double boiler or used one. There are recipes. Okay, you want to go about halfway. There are recipes that call for cooked rice, and then you make a custard with eggs and, uh, and rice and sugar and cinnamon, and you mix that together, and then you bake that like a custard. That's one way. I've never made it like that. I've tried, and it just never seems to be as good. You put the top part of the double boiler on top, and then inside three simple ingredients and that's what is mind-blowing about rice pudding if there's anything mind-blowing about rice pudding you put three cups of whole milk write this down three cups of whole milk half a cup of arborio rice if you're from the UK you'll see it called pudding rice it might be called sticky rice arborio Italian 
uh, cal, cal rose rice. It's, it's a thick, thick piece of rice. It's not basmati and it's not jasmine. So you put that in and you put in half a cup of sugar. I reduce it. I know my sister reduces it also. And then the trick that makes my rice pudding just a little bit better than my sister's is I put in a stick of cinnamon. I let it stew with that. And so you've got three cups of milk, half a cup of sugar, half a cup, half a cup, <laughs> half a cup of rice. That's it. That's it. Three ingredients. Then you put that on, you put it on your big girl stove or this stove and you cook it for till it's done. It's going to be about an hour, an hour and a half. Thing you don't want to do is let the bottom of, I thought there was pudding in there, let the bottom run out of water because then you've got a problem. So you just, you hear it steaming every once in a while, check it. So that's rice pudding. Can you try, try beet leaf live right now? Can you try it? You mean, are you suspecting that I don't eat this? All right, beet leaf. I know that uh, Liz is growing this in her kitchen right now. I don't know if she's tried it, but if you look inside, there are little leaves that are starting to grow and they won't continue to grow until I take the outer ones. This is free lettuce and I read about it. It's full of vitamin C, vitamin K. What is vitamin K? So I sometimes take the, I, I don't take the little in ones. I take the little outside big ones. This one actually is, I just snip it like that. Do I need to wash it? No, because it's in my house and my house is always clean. All right. This might even be enough. I don't want to completely take it all off. So would I eat this? It's delicious delicious. Okay, uh, that's it for our show today. We are going, the chicken paprikash is ready for dinner. The buns are going to be put into the oven when they're ready. And you could have your rice pudding if you felt like making that. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, she ate the leaf. I did eat the leaf. Yes, I did. It was delicious too. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, next, uh, next Sunday, we're going to do a different kind of show. Uh, Liz has um, suggested to me that I do some average tools that could be part of your kitchen and if you need those tools and what makes a kitchen work well. So uh, because it's getting close to Valentine's Day though, we're going to first start off next week with a chocolate lava cake and then we're going to go into some of the tools. This coming week is Groundhog Day, not like we haven't been doing things over and over and over. Happy Groundhog Day. Bye. <laughs>